Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Father Mark Bosco. I'm the Vice President of Mission and Ministry at Georgetown University. So welcome to one of our signature events during Jesuit Heritage Month, a conversation with the author and veteran Phil Cly. And we're calling this event the Ignatian Imagination, a Veteran's Perspective, as we are keenly aware that Mr. Cly's coming to campus is just days after our nation's celebration of Veterans Day. Uh, during Jesuit Heritage Month, we as a community of Georgetown, of students, faculty, and staff, look to deepen our awareness about the way Jesuit education engages us in so many aspects of our life here on campus and afterward. Whether it's our roots in Ignatian spirituality, the way our literary imaginations are formed by our Jesuit values, our common pursuit of a faith that does justice, and the many ways that Jesuits have played a part in educating Georgetown students for over 200 years. So many events during this month of November have tried to draw us together in prayer, in conversation, and in celebration. I'm pleased to welcome uh, Phil Cly to Georgetown and to his parents as well, and to his brother, another a Georgetown alum, uh, mom and, and brother. So welcome back. Um, Phil's fiction, as you know, uh, draws on his training as a U.S. Marine and his mil military service in Iraq, as well as on his Jesuit education. Phil is a proud graduate of Regis High School in New York, the class of 2001. He then graduated from Dartmouth and then joined the Marines. After being discharged, he received an MFA from Hunter College of the City University of New York. His first book, the New York Times bestseller, Redeployment, won the National Book Award for Fiction in 2014 and won many other awards. He received the Marine Corps Heritage Foundation's James Webb Award and the National Book Critics Circle John Leonard Award for Best Debut Work in Any Genre. Clay's essays have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, as well as in the American Scholar, the Atlantic, and the New Yorker magazine. He was awarded this year with the George W. H. W. H. Excuse me, the George W. Hunt S. J. Prize for Journalism, Arts, and Letters for outstanding work in the category of cultural and historical criticism. His most recent piece, which is on the web now, but I think will be published I hear in December, is called Deployment to Iraq Changed My View of God. And it, will, it appeared in the Veterans Day issue of America Magazine Online. So for my students up, up in the front here, we'll be putting that on Canvas pretty soon <laughs> for you to watch or to see. Um, Clay joins uh, our own Paul uh, Eli, an award-winning author himself and a former editor at Ferrer, Strauss, and Giroux, which in many ways um, kept the, the flame alive of good, uh, serious Catholic fiction throughout the 20th century, and even now in the 21st century. Uh, he is a Berkeley Center f Senior Fellow at Georgetown, and he'll lead us in a conversation that explores Phil's life, his Jesuit education, his war experience, and his work as a writer. I'd like to thank Paul and the Berkeley Center's Faith and Culture Series for collaborating with the Office of Mission and Ministry in making this afternoon possible. After Paul and Phil's conversation, there'll be time for questions and answers, and of course, a chance to have your copy of Redeployment signed by the author. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Phil Clyde to Georgetown. Thank you, Father Bosco, for the warm welcome, and thanks for asking me to take part in this conversation. It's one that I've hoped to have for a couple of years, and family life got in the way. Uh, <laughs> your second child was... Yeah, we originally tried to set this up, but uh, we were having uh, boy number two, so, yeah. <laughs> Not that moment, but <laughs> <laughs> in those weeks, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. You wrote a piece for the New York Times in which you observed that You've been out of the military for a lot longer than you were in it. Same is true for your Jesuit education. <laughs> you know, when you were going through Regis, class of 2001, could you have imagined that 17 years later you would be um, trying to explain its significance uh, to an audience here at Georgetown? Uh, no. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I couldn't have imagined that much further. Uh, I, I'm still navigating by feel through. <laughs> through um, to the world. Though I knew, you know, I knew, 
how important it was to me. I mean, Jesuit education was really formative for a whole variety of ways, not just in terms of, um, in the kind of like, it's a good education, it will help you be successful in the world sort of instrumental way, but it was, you know, I think that, that a lot of the, 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 the teachers there and, and the, the way the education was, was organized was, you know, you were supposed to understand the way in which you know, what you were learning was not just about kind of instrumental purposes in the world, but tied to a certain way of being both, um, you know, an intellectual, a moral person, a spiritual person, how those things, you know, how those different aspects of your life were supposed to be unified, which I think was really um, important and valuable to me and something, you know, pretty critical to get at a, at a young age. Was there a moment that stood out? One of the things that's so strong about your fiction is the way the particularity of it, the intense uh, focus on distinct episodes and not on a, a general idea of, of wartime. So again, and I'm going to work this parallel between the military and the church, between war and uh, <clears throat> education. We're going to work it mercilessly for the entire hour. Yeah. <laughs> so, but was there a moment that you, you said to yourself, I must remember this, something is happening to me? So I had... Um, well, so in terms of the education, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's a way in which, I think especially in, in, sometimes in the American education system, you're taught to read literature as, as like it's a riddle, right? Like, you know, find the theme, find the idea that you can extract out and then use to regurgitate onto a page. And I remember um, uh, I was part of a, a club called Kira where this sort of, legendary teacher at Regis, Mr. Connolly, uh, would like, we'd read um, Catholic-related literature, and then we, we also worked at an emergency, uh, volunteered in an emergency um, AIDS hospice in the village. And we were trying to get our hands around a Flannery O'Connor short story. We were basically trying to tell, like, figure out what it meant. And Which just one? Said, um, Circle in the Fire. And, and he said, okay, stop. <laughs> Think of it as an experience that you're entering into. You know, like this is Connolly talking. Yeah, like you're. You, don't don't tell me what this means any more than you know, what happened to you yesterday or some sort of event in your life meant. Like, talk through what it felt like to read this and and relate to these characters. And I think that was a tremendously valuable thing, not just for the reading of literature, but also later as, as a writer. Um, you know, I think about I think about that a lot. Just sort of you know the moment we said okay. This has gone off the rails. You need to stop and, and actually look at this as a piece of art rather than as some sort of, you know, kind of um, riddle to be untangled. And how would you, what's distinctively Jesuit about that in your estimation? And that sounds just like good sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know what's, what's, I don't know what's specifically Jesuit about it, other than the way in which I think the, um, you know, the 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 reading of the literature was tied to, you know, doing something practical in the world in that particular club. That, you know, you're supposed to be having this experience of reading literature uh, at a sort of, you know, emotional and aesthetic letter, uh, level. You're supposed to be, you know going out and doing something useful and, and good for, for people at this, um, you know, place that was run by um, uh, a couple of nuns who were like the happiest people in the world. It was like a joyful place. Um, and, you know, that these kind of, I think there's a way in which sometimes we, you know, we kind of compartmentalize our, our lives. Um, and uh, that trying to sort of unify those things. In a way, that's, that's something that is related to something that I'm always trying to do in my fiction, where it's like, here are these disparate elements, and, and they, they do actually speak to each other. They're, they're part of a sort of more broad general experience, and finding the sort of narrative through line through these things that don't feel like they belong together or shouldn't necessarily belong together, if you can kind of track that down and see how kind of moral and aesthetic and spiritual questions can all be um, bound together uh, and, and sort of 
held together in some way, that's when you're, that's when you're actually kind of striking to the core of something that really matters. I think that's right. I went to Fordham some years earlier than you went to Regis, but some of the same, uh, the sense of wholeness of things being connected, uh, the human race is one, uh, our experiences bear on those of others and owe something to the experience of people who preceded us and have consequences for people who come after us and we're not just isolated individuals uh, moving forward in our, our cells of individual experience, but uh, we're, we're bound up together whether we like it or not. Yeah. You mentioned before I let Regis go, um, another significant experience, um, dancing with Stephanie Ger Germanata. <laughs> Can you tell us that story? Lady Gaga. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I said, uh, yeah, as a, a buddy of mine um, uh, briefly dated. Uh, she's a lovely, lovely girl back then. So she went to a private girls' yeah. Catholic school across mm -hmm. the street from Regis in Upper Manhattan. Yeah, like she went to a Sacred Heart, I think. And a couple of my friends were in a band with her. They really should start that band back up. <laughs> I think. We'll let you write the songs. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, yeah. I, 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 I danced with her at my prom. Uh, she was, she was great. She was a lovely person. Um, that's all I have to report. <laughs> One of the things that struck me reading Redeployment and re reading it again, I mentioned to you that I read it you know, essentially when it came out, is the, the sense that pervades the book of the men in the Marine Corps and the people uh, in military service in Iraq having a very, very strong sense that this experience uh, is different from what's available back home and yet also interrogating that, experience, that, that, that sense of themselves as chosen or privileged or elect. And not to uh, make, make the point too fine, but I remember at Regis also when I took my sons there for an interview, this very strong sense that we do di things differently here. Mm -hmm. What is it about, so there's Jesuit high school and the Marine Corps and then military experience, and running through them all is this, ins this insistence on the part of the characters in your work that um, things are being done differently, that uh, you're set apart from, from everyday life. It, it seems to be a preoccupation of yours. Well, I mean, the, the importance of specific situations and cultures uh, that we find ourselves in, right? That, um, you know, the, you know, if, if, if if you're a Catholic, it's not just a sort of isolate individual soul moving through the world, having a kind of unique um, individual relationship with God. You're part of a broader community. You are part of the uh, body of Christ. You are part of uh, a, you know uh, an institution, a broader institution, a set of practices and rituals, and um, and that communal aspect of, of the religion is, is, is critical for, for you know, giving it life and, and, and meaning. Um, uh, you, you know, and so in, you know, the, I, I make this point in, in, in the last essay that I wrote, you know, the Samuel Huntington Hunting once said, you know, if modern man will find his monastery, he might find it in the, in the military, right? And the military has its own kind of like, you know, set of customs and rules. You go in, you get a new haircut. Thankfully, not the tonsure. Um, you, um, uh, you know, you have a new way of speaking. You have a new way of dress. You're told that you know, race and class and race and class don't matter here. You're told that you're supposed to, you know, uh, embrace mortification of the flesh. You've got military saints. You know, Medal of Honor recipients, Navy SAR recipients who have. You know, done these kind of heroic things that you're, you know, sort of show you the different ways in which you can be a good uh, marine um, uh, set of rituals and practices and call and response and all these other things. And it's this kind of, you know, system of meaning. Um, and I think that's actually one of the things that makes it very sort of strange and isolating leaving the Marine Corps because, um, you know, you have this whole culture, right? And even if you're the guy, like if you're the Marine who's like, screw the core, you know? Like that's a whole identity in and of itself, right? Like in the core, like you can be that guy, right? Well, like that's a, a whole thing is like being the guy, like you're outside in the civilian world, you'd be like, screw the core, and people be like, 
okay, you know, it doesn't matter, it doesn't mean anything. Um, and, and, you know, so you don't have that sort of, um, in just sort of kind of community and sense of purpose that you're embedded within that you can react against. Um, and I think, you know, sort of uh, in, the, in, the, in the book, one of the things that I'm looking at is, okay, you know, it's not just about being in the military. It's about, you know, what does it mean to be in Iraq in this specific place with this specific unit doing this specific job? Um, you know, what kind of decisions does that put you into? What kind of acts of collective storytelling are you a part of or trying to react against? Um, and how do you, on a sort of moral or spiritual level, navigate the kind of choices that come before you? As you're talking, I'm hearing Father Mark in the back of my mind. I'm imagining him saying, doesn't Paul know that the Society of Jesus was modeled on a military order? <laughs> and this whole rift that he's running out before us is quite obvious. Uh, that, as you, as you say, uh, particular language, particular rites, particular rituals, particular expectations, a sense of um, things that are done in the core, in the society, that aren't done elsewhere. But um, beyond that, what happens to the characters in your stories it's not just by virtue of the fact that they're Marines that they feel this set apartness. It's what they've seen, yep. what they felt, uh, the horror, the horror, you know, Conrad. Uh, it, it, it really marks people in the way that, mm -hmm. that, that you describe it in the book. It, you've, you've seen things that, that set you apart from uh, the guys you meet at a Regis uh, reunion or whatever, just by virtue of being in Iraq. You know, I think just in life, regardless of whether you've been to war or not, and, and, and you know, in my personal experience, I didn't have such a kind of intense, you know, I was a public affairs officer, right? I, I had a pretty safe job, right, in a very dangerous place. Um, I had a very safe job in a, in a very dangerous place. And so I had experiences that were deeply important to me um, I, I don't think that, I don't think it's just necessarily war experience that, that utterly separates you from civilian life, though I think we like to tell ourselves that, right? And I had this um, very strange experience with uh, a friend of mine after um, I'd written a piece for the New York Times about the experience of seeing a Marine die in a combat hospital on, on my base when I was in Iraq. And it was, it was, a, it was a piece about that and about a, a suicide bombing in the aftermath of the suicide bombing and the injured people came in. It was, it was about a kind of sense of shocked numbness, right? And she started talking to me and telling me that the piece had resonated with her because she was a victim of childhood abuse. And she started talking to me about, you know, some of the things that she had endured and why you know, I had articulated things that resonated with her. And then in the middle of it, she, she stops and she says, you know, oh, not that I'm comparing what I've been through to what you've been through. I could never imagine what you've been through, right? Um, which, you know, if you can imagine sitting for a long time at a cheap plywood desk in like a cheap <laughs> plywood hut in the desert, you can imagine what I've been through. Um, uh, and yeah, here she is. She's endured things that would be difficult to think about going through as an adult, let alone as a child, right? And yet, she is not, not simply, you know, she's assuming that I can understand. And in fact, that, that, that I have talked about things where there is a commonality between us, right? And so I think one of the things is that there's, there's this... Um, sometimes tendency in the culture, and especially, not just with, with war experience, but especially with war experience to say, here's this utter, utterly alien experience that you, know, you can't understand, that forever separates you. And it seems like it's kind of giving the veteran a pride of place, but I actually sort of feel like it's putting them in a box, right? And, um, and I think it's, it's, it's really limiting because I don't think I don't think we as human beings, you know, this is sort of like, you know, you wouldn't know unless you were there. 
I don't think we as human beings understand ourselves or our, our experiences until we've had time to process them, until we've had time to talk about them with other people. Often other people with radically different experiences who can and help us kind of grow beyond ourselves or see different perspectives. There's a bit, uh, Karl Marlantis, a Vietnam veteran, a fantastic writer, has a bit in one of his books where he says, um, you know, if you ask a 20-year-old veteran at the gas station what it feels like to kill a man, his probable angry answer, if he's being honest, is it doesn't feel like a fucking thing. But, he says, if you ask the same veteran the same question 40 years later, you might get a very different response. And for Melantis, it's not just about the veteran, what he's been through, it's about the community around him, how that community, what stories about war that community's been telling itself, what, what they've been communicating to that veteran, how they've helped that person process that experience or hindered him in doing that. And, um, and so I think there is this sense of, you know, of experiences that sort of forever alienate me. And there are, there are definitely ways in which you know, the experiences that people have can be tremendously challenging, right, to, to deal with. Um, but people in, people in everyday life have that as well, right? Um, and so I think that that sort of, uh, and there's a kind of political weight to it too, right, where we have this kind of like sacred aura around the veteran where that, that experience is something that you can't even touch, right? And that's why, you know, and it often gets kind of used politically, right? So uh, if you say, as, as uh, Sean Spicer said, uh, when there was a you know, special operator died in Yemen, you know, if you, you criticize this raid, it's an insult to the, you know, the family. You owe an apology to the family of that, uh, you know, that guy. And it's like, you know, he's already died for the country. Don't prop up his corpse to hide behind for political cover, right? It's this, I think, it seems like it's giving honor to the veteran, but I actually think that it's, it's it's setting them aside in another category and, and making it so that we don't actually have to deal with those experiences because I think that um, you know, war experience is something that the entire society does have responsibility towards and responsibility to think about and talk about and I don't think that it's just about the veteran or, or f sort of forever isolates them. I'm so glad you answered that question in that complicated way because it was really, I posed a simple question that listening to you reply, you've spent all your work complicating, not just the book, but the piece, there's a piece you wrote about Eric Greitens. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. In The New Yorker, this mm -hmm. uh, Navy SEAL who has um, used uh, slender experience as a Navy SEAL as a um, political, uh, part of his political resume f for a while now, and the piece was about the, um, the, the, the claim of experience and the way it's evaluated by people who have that experience. And the way it can be leveraged in different contexts. So uh, yeah, one of the things that was interesting about Greitens, who did, who did this serve. This the guy who was the governor yeah. of Missouri. And Resigned was, in uh, scandal, yeah. And so you know, his, a lot of his kind of public persona was about having been a Navy SEAL. He was a Navy SEAL, he got a Trident, but he never served with SEAL teams. Um, he served in Iraq in a different capacity, he was injured, there was a suicide, uh, truck bomb, uh, where he inhaled, you know, substantial quantities of chlorine gas, and I think had other sort of small injuries, and so he, you know, he's, he served honorably, had a Purple Heart, but also had never been in a SEAL team, never done the sort of, you know, things that SEALs had done, and you know, he came out with a book that came out right before the um, Osama bin Laden raid, right, and he sort of he rose to fame, and he was originally uh, in charge of a, a nonprofit that actually does, does great work. The mission continues uh, and continues to do good, good work uh, with veterans and help veterans give back to their communities. But um, he sort of, you know, would go on MSNBC and talk about SEAL Team 6. He could go to the- hundred times probably. Yeah, you know, the Harvard you know, School of Public Diplomacy and, and, and have this kind of very sort of slick, sophisticated presentation about how, you know, the need to have the heart and the fist and, you know, um, and then when he decided to run for governor as a Republican, you know, the persona changed and he was putting out advertisements where, you know, he was like shooting guns and blowing things up and, uh, and you know, say like Navy SEAL, you know, conservative Navy SEAL. Um, uh, this one, one, one Navy SEAL told me, he said, um, he was just, he was like, you know, cause he's like, you see his ads where he's shooting things and blowing things up? This guy, the only thing this guy blew up was the Republican party. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but what was sort of interesting about him was he, he never lied, right? So if you talked about sort of their special operators, 
who put out memoirs where their books are, you know, or, or a lot of the, th the things that they've said in public are just sort of provably false, right? So, you know, uh, Chris, Chris Kyle of American Sniper fame told a whole bunch of falsehoods, right? That are, you know, and he's like telling stories about shooting would-be bandits on a Texas highway and all this other stuff. But he was, you know, whatever you can say about him in his public persona, he, he walked the walk. He, he was a legitimate, you know, had, had been there and done that and, and been in a lot of combat, uh, was decorated for it. And, you know, guys I talked to in the community, whatever they felt about his public persona, you know, this guy was a real warrior. You know, um, uh, what's his name? Mark Luttrell, you know, his book is riddled with inaccuracies. At one point he, like, describes finding the WMDs in Iraq and just kind of, like, moves on. Like, well, <laughs> um, but, uh, but again, you know, this, you know, really did the sorts of things that created the kind of public image that Eric Greitens was... Uh, trading upon, whereas Greitens actually never lied, but had a very sophisticated understanding of what the American public would backfill into their expectations about who he was, given you know what his resume was. It was just, it was kind of, I mean, it was just, you know, I wrote that piece because I was, I was sort of fascinated by this, this guy and the way that he had leveraged that sort of the mystique of the veteran, particularly the mystique of the Navy SEAL, at a time when the Navy SEAL sort of image in popular culture was exploding in prominence. And then there was a community of Navy SEALs and former Navy SEALs who were deeply frustrated by, by him and other people sort of like him and you know, what they felt that was doing to um, the image of the Navy SEALs in the community to have you know, that kind of image being presented out there. Um, and so I think there's this very strange relationship that America has with the kind of public image of, of veterans in general, of special operators. Um, I mean, special operators are like, uh, you know, those are like the hot stories of the moment because they're, you know, they're super soldiers. Um, you know, you got Zero Dark Thirty, you got uh, American Sniper. You have these war stories that you can tell. If you're telling the story of special operators who did, you know, combat raids or whatever, they're like the perfect stories for the, you know, post 9-11 wars um, because a raid has a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? Like a, a group of tough warriors, they, they gear up, they go get a bad guy, and then they kill him or capture him, and then that's the end, right? And that's like, it's like a morality play, right? And in, in, in an era of constant warfare, what could be more satisfying than having, you know, something with a beginning, middle, and end, uh, which is exactly what these wars lack. Um, and so, yeah, there's this kind of fascination with it. These are the stories that we like telling ourselves. Um, and yet they trouble me, and I think it, you know, it kind of bleeds into the political realm. Uh, President Obama's last State of the Union address, he said something along the lines of, you know, if you think I'm not serious about fighting terrorism or national security, just ask Osama bin Laden. Ask, uh, you know, uh, the guy who planned the Benghazi raid who we just picked up. And I was like, I don't really think we have a coherent military policy right now, but your answer to that is, remember when I killed the guy? You know. But it sounds good, you know, it has this kind of, it seems like there's a finality. Even though, you know, after, you know, almost two decades, you know, we're gonna get there pretty soon, we know the limits of just kind of kinetic raids. So, first of all, you, there's this idea of <clears throat> uh, war experience, a combat experience that's separating the soldier from others that you've unpacked and complicated. And then there's this idea of war as a, um, as a quick hit, a, a drama involving um, mm -hmm. guns where uh, somebody wins and somebody loses and somebody dies and somebody's left standing. Yeah. And you and your work are trying to complicate that also. And say, yeah, let's we, look at the way the story really falls. I mean, a lot of what a lot of guys that I knew, I mean, it's very interesting talking to guys who did the sort of special operator route versus like a lot of guys who are kind of landowners doing you know, working with a local community where they're trying to reach out to local sheikhs. Um, a buddy of mine, Matt Gallagher, uh, used to joke with his, um, we just go out a, a meeting after meeting where you're getting like chai with uh, uh, local sheikhs. And he used to joke with his, uh, his soldiers, you know, it is imperative to US national security that American soldiers drink as much chai tea 
as humanly possible. Uh, his soldiers called it shy hunting, the, the things. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this is a really interesting, uh, he was in the Special Forces, Ian Fishback. I, 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 wrote, I, I wrote a little bit about him in, in the last piece, but he, he's now doing, um, uh, getting a degree in philosophy uh, and working on just war theory. And he, he tells a story about being in Iraq and he had, you know, he's special forces, so theoretically these are supposed to be the warrior diplomats or the guys who work with local forces and, and train them and strengthen them. And he had a, I think it was his uh, team leader or, uh, who didn't want to do any counterinsurgency. It's like, I wish we could just go back to the days of bashing each other over the head on rock, with rocks, you know. And, you know, there's, there's kind of one mission that the guy wanted to do where uh, he wanted to go after, like, car thieves, you know. They go in helicopters and, 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 and attack people. And Fishback was like, I don't really see how this has anything to do with our mission, you know. And he's like, oh, you're being a coward. She's like, you can do it, but bring Iraqis along so at least there's kind of training value that you get out of it. And then not much later, um, there's this possibility of working with uh, some local sheikhs, meeting them. It was, would involve going to a somewhat dangerous area. And uh, the guy tells him, sir, you're being reckless. And he was like, look, I can't be both a coward and reckless. You have to pick one. And it's like, <laughs> why do you like the, you know, that mission and not this one? Let me guess. Because one, you get to go in helicopters and like, shoot guns and do cool things. And the other one, you're just going to drink tea. But like, guess what? This is actually the work. This is the more important thing. Um, yeah. When you answer again and again, you these characters start talking. <laughs> you know, it, you, Phil, you stop talking. You start quoting these other figures. <laughs> That's just the way th their voices are in in your head, or all the stuff that you heard then is still really present to you. I mean, this is, this is like something I had from a conversation with him like a year ago. <laughs> so uh, I never knew him uh, while I was in. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that, that, that's how I think about it. These, you know, <laughs> these stories about the wars that we're engaged in that don't fit into the normal narratives of what a war story is supposed to be or what a satisfying war story that you tell at the bar is supposed to be tend to be the ones that I, I, I'm, you know, the most interested in. And I think that's probably related to why the book is, you know, I'll tell the story of an adjutant or a, a mortuary affairs guy or a you know foreign service officer trying to, you know, who's tasked with teaching Iraqis baseball. Um, Did you think about it in terms of other war literature? Like when I think about Michael Hur's dispatches, yeah. it's all in his head. It's a psychedelic war, yeah. and there's long runs of prose that are just uh, the language of the authors inner life uh, and his you know perceptions. What, um, and yours is you know, dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. <laughs> Pe people having it out with each other on the page. So uh, was, it, was it John Sack? Who wrote Company M? Sack, right, the Vietnam reporter? Anyway, he said Michael Hare was the best journalist to have written about um, Vietnam because you know, he's like, most of us go out and we'd, you know, come back and kind of recoup, look at our notes, try and explain things, and Hare was actually understood that you need to go out and experience going insane. You know, like getting exhausted, going nutty. He donated his sanity to the cause of journalism and it's in the prose of dispatches. And, uh, and somebody asked Hare about that. He was like, yeah, I guess I did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's, a, that's an amazing book. Um, Absolutely, yeah, the war literature was, was in my mind. I mean, I think that you, you sort of, you need to understand the tradition that you're operating in and the kind of narratives about war that, that, that sort of permeate your culture because, I mean, we're just talking about this, this idea of like war experience as being incommunicable. Where does that come from? I mean, it comes from, uh, you know, World War I, you've got, uh, you know, the trench poets doing this kind of like inverted romantic, poetry where you have this sort of, you know, kind of ineffable experience of war that can't, can't be transmitted to the uh, civilians back home. Dulcet de Decorum Est is dedicated to Jesse Pope. And it's, you know, if you, you know, if you could see as I do, you know, the people dying uh, in World War I, uh, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't write poetry the way you do. But, you know, you don't have the experience. And, you know, and that goes, you know, Hemingway, 
Uh, so, you know, combat's a thing that only those who have been through it can, can, can write about. Hemingway, who wrote about combat um, very well and, you know, had been like hit with shrapnel once, right? Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a marvelous bit in Vasily Grossman's um, uh, Life and Fate, this wonderful World War II novel where there's a, a, a Soviet general who's talking about how, you know, Tolstoy could write about the Napoleonic Wars because he was there and, and, and one of the guys goes, no, he wasn't. He wasn't even born <laughs> then. Um, you know, and, and so this, this kind of sense of, of, of war experiences as this kind of other realm of existence and also all the other kind of narratives that we have, understanding the way that that has been expressed over, over different people and different attitudes towards war and different types of experience. But then the other thing that was very important for me writing the book was stories that were, um, that don't kind of fit into what we normally think of as the normal war canon. So the normal war canon, when we think of it, we tend to think of like the modern period, you know, Red Badge of Courage and the Trench Poets and uh, Remark and then, you know, you get Hemingway and Orwell and then you get, um, you know, Joseph Heller and James Jones and then you get Tim O'Brien, right? And it's like mostly sort of like white frontline soldiers. Um, but there's a whole wealth of other things that deal with war in really interesting ways, you know? Um, whether it's, you know, Andrea Barrett's Ether of Space, uh, just, just, just actually reading on the way here, wonderful Mavis Gallant, uh, uh, story called uh, the late Ho uh, the late homecomer uh, about so she a, lived in Paris during World War Two right yeah um, you know about a you know kid from the Hitler Youth who was in a POW camp long after he should have been who comes home you know after having served in the war as like a sixteen year old um, the there's a, there's a uh, you know when I was writing one of the stories uh, Wagugali's beer in the snooker club was what I was thinking about, and that's a, a, it's a it's Egyptian. Think like if Evelyn Waugh was like an Egyptian cop during the Suez Crisis, that's kind of what this novel's <laughs> like. Like you read it and you're just like laughing the whole time and then you close the cover and you're just, I'm more depressed than I've ever been in my life. It's a great book, you should all read it. Um, and in the middle of that book, it's about the, basically these like two hipster Egyptian cops who are like bumming around Cairo. You know, they're from like wealthy families, they don't have money themselves, they're kind of overeducated talking about books, and then in the middle of the, after the Suez crisis, they go to uh, London, and they meet this woman on a bus, and she's like, oh, you're Egyptian. You should come home with, and you should, you know, you should meet my son. He was just in Egypt. He's a soldier. You know, like, he was just in Egypt, like, invading your country, yeah. like, trying to continue colonialism. <laughs> and they're Egyptian hipsters, so, like, that would be awesome. We totally want to meet your son. <laughs> so then they meet this sort of, like, you know, not well-educated, very kind of solicitous British Tommy who is trying to be nice, but he's also, you know, he's, like, reciting racist barracks gossip at them, right? So he's like, oh, Egypt, you know, great place. You got to look out for the wogs, though. They steal, right? Like, not connecting that he's saying racist things to the people that he's being racist about, right? And then um, they start kind of tormenting him and kind of enjoying tormenting him because he's saying racist things and they're kind of egging him on and they're kind of getting this weird revenge on him. And it's this weird, painful scene where you're not sure whether you know, it's, you know, there's like kind of this kind of sort of post-colonial lens you can look in from. There's like sort of issues of like class and education uh, and then just basic sort of uh, human motivations. And it's this really funny, painful, interesting scene. That's a very different kind of return of the soldier than you get in stuff that we kind of normally think about in, in war fiction. So, you know, reading other kinds of narratives um, was really important. Uh, while I was writing the book, and and uh, yeah, and also stuff that has nothing to do with war at all. <laughs> you mentioned the uh, essay that you've at, got out in the current issue of America, or online anyway. How deployment changed your view of God. If I'm reading it right, and if I'm not, we'll move on to the next question. <laughs> but the the insight that you develop in the essay um, is closely akin to the one that's dramatized in the story Prayer in the Furnace mm -hmm. about uh, God and our relation to God. And, and 
if I'm right, can you tell me what, it, what it's like to take a run at that insider material in fiction and then to do it again some years later in an essay? Yeah. And I won't give away the, the kernel of significance that, that at least ends Prayer in the Furnace. So pr Prayer in the Furnace is about a chaplain um, so with a unit, attached to a unit in Ramadi in, in 2000. Catholic chaplain, right? Catholic chaplain. Um, and, you know, Ramadi then was very, very violent. And a Marine comes to him and sort of gives this kind of odd half confession that Marines in the unit have, have been killing civilians. And then the story from there, there's kind of operates on two tracks where on the one he's trying to get to the bottom of this, trying to, you know, within the context of this bureaucratic organization that in many ways, you know, is very adaptable at protecting itself, um, get something done about what's happening uh, or what he suspects is happening. And then on the other hand, still attempt to minister to these men spiritually, right? And specifically minister to the um, Marine who has come to him, who is sort of seems to possibly want the sacrament of reconciliation, but also can't can't do that and wants, wants something more, wants something imminent, wants something um, that's not a ritual but will actually sort of solve the problem, the real problem, the moral and spiritual problem that he's come to the chaplain with and kind of forces a sort of um, spiritual crisis on the chaplain. Um, and <laughs> it's, it's kind of the, you know, the sort of the sort of it's kind of the center story of the book, right? Um, where, you know, kind of moral and psychological and spiritual questions about war and... and the word theodicy shows up probably for the only time in contemporary American fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, he, and, you know, the chaplain's thinking about Augustine. He has a, a, a mentor of his. I mentioned Mr. Connolly uh, earlier. The priest who writes him on a typewriter is called Father Connolly and... and a lot of the Regis guys are like, you were, yeah, uh, that's the connect, that's why I named him that. Um, mentions uh, Bernanos, whose uh, Diary of a Country Priest I was reading as I was writing the story, right? And, and it's a, you know, it's a novel about, it's not about war really, though there is an, an interesting moment where a, a French Foreign Legion veteran shows up and has some interesting thoughts about justice. But, you know, it's a novel about all the same things that you find in war literature guilt, community, the people, the ways people use their own suffering and pain to justify cruelty towards others. Um, you know, the, the possibility of grace in, um, in, a, in a broken world. Um, and so, yeah, that's what, you know, that's what that, that's trying to dramatize. And I think in, in, in the essay, <laughs> uh, it's always hard to sum up one of these things right after I know. Uh, it. You know, Flannery O'Connor was in this position, and the guy said to her, you know, would you like to tell us what happened in that story? And she said, I most certainly would not. <laughs> 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 so you can beg off any time here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like if I could sum it up in a sentence, I would have just written the sentence. Yeah. 6,000 words. <laughs> right. Um, I, I think it's, it's about this sort of sense that I had there was, a, there was an operation where the military went into this region in a small town south of Fallujah. And they went in the middle of, middle of the night and, and kind of kicked people out of their homes. And then over the, like the engineers came in right after the, uh, it was the, an army unit, um, and then built combat outposts just right there where they had moved, like fortified the, the buildings and such. And uh, you know, I went in like two days after this happened. And so you, know, you drive through bulletproof glass into you know like a fortified compound and everything is kind of like orderly and controlled. You um, you know sort of wars just like this kind of chaotic environment. And so the military, which is this very kind of structured hierarchical thing, comes with this kind of mobile society that can just come in and and enforce a sort of sort of order where they are and you know geometric fields of fire and everything. So. Uh, and then you go in and, and you know, we're receiving this briefing and they've got maps, like a blue force tracker where you can see where everything is. And you've got, you know, here's a map of every um, 
you know, violent incident, here are the kind of nodes of power, you know, and so, you, you know, when you're in the center of this combat outpost, totally surrounded by Americans, you, you feel like we dominate this town, we understand this town, we know everything about it, we are totally secure, and then you step outside, <laughs> you step outside the combat outpost, and you just like look down a ro road, and you're like, uh, you know, like, I could never just walk down that road. Like, I don't know anything about this place. I don't know these people. Um, and that sort of, like, the sort of, especially kind of like this kind of, like, data-driven illusion of mastery and control um, that is not just a function of war, but also happens, I think, in the way that we, in, in peacetime, especially now in our, like, increasingly technologized, Facebook algor <laughs> alg algorithmized world, um, versus uh, what it is to be immersed in a culture, in a set of practices. Um, uh, there's a, uh, the practice of the everyday by um, it's a Jesuit Michel de Certeau. Somebody pronounced the French better than I did. Michel de Certeau. He sounds like he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Um, where he has this, this beautiful description of being at the top of the World Trade Center and, and looking down on Manhattan. And it's this grid, you know, and, and this God's eye view of the city where, you, you know, you think like it's this kind of text you can read. And then the experience of, you know, the city dweller walking through the city and not actually necessarily obeying the grid or, you know, jaywalking or using, you know, using the city in a way that is not intelligible to somebody looking above from the God's eye view and the way in which humans, no matter what the, no matter what the sort of structured plan that you try and channel them into, um, always have this way of um, disobeying or, or interacting with the structures of our world in a unique way because we're humans and we do that. Uh, and, he, and he talks about the sort of the un, like the, the wanderings of the city dweller as unconscious poems that they write but cannot themselves read. Um, and that sense of what human life and human existence is versus that sort of like uh, ordered rational grid um, and control version, uh, that's kind of the starting place of of the of the piece and also kind of reflections that deal with Hannah Rent's thoughts about violence and power and the difference between the two, um, and and how my differing relations to sort of my sense of of human mastery over ourselves really as a society led me um, first out of a relationship with the church and then back in. I don't know if that was intelligible, but so you go so. From a position of supposed mastery, yeah. you're brought to recognition of dependency and interdependency. Yeah. And that happened in war in a way that is consonant with what, um, what, what we're brought toward by the teachings of the church. Yeah. That, uh, that interdependency and dependency is, is, I think you say in the essay, is a form of power. Right. Uh, rather than what we typically take to be power, which is... Um, the ability to uh, dominate or to master somebody else. Right. You did a real um, jujitsu move there. You uh, explain the story in essay form, and then explain the essay by telling a story. <laughs> uh, it was, I mean, I hope you notice it. This is a, a natural storyteller, right, sitting right here, who just keeps telling, going into narrative mode to answer the questions. It's just really striking to be on the other end of it. Because you just you keep going going to well, there's this guy and there's this truck and there's this field, <laughs> and it's it's very powerful to 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 witness, I guess. What's this story that um, you allude to the the story of American intervention in Colombia that's now on your desk? Yeah, so I'm working on a novel. Uh, I have a full draft, doing edits now on the final third of the novel. So wish me luck. Uh, so it's coming. Been working on it for five years. Um, so, yeah, a uh, couple reasons that I decided to work on sort of the post-9-11 U.S. intervention in Colombia. One of which is probably that I'm married to a Colombian-American um, and, you know, doing research in Medellin while hanging out with family and, you know, uh, 
eating my wife's grandmother's food is, is pretty good. Um, but also, so the novel starts in Iraq and Afghanistan and then moves to Colombia and then actually moves back to another conflict uh, towards the end. Uh, Colombia is a very interesting way to talk about the way that America has used power around the world. So for example, every ambassador to Colombia post 9-11 has gone on to be involved with the wars in um, Iraq or Afghanistan in some way. Uh, two ambassadors, U.S. ambassadors to Colombia went on to be um, ambassador to Afghanistan as their next posting. One went on to be ambassador to Pakistan, others uh, um, like under secretary of long title for uh, <laughs> counter narcotics. Um, and uh, also there's sort of things that, because uh, it's a counterinsurgency, counter narcotics fight with high value targeting, right? Targeted assassination. Um, uh, and there's sort of kind of cross pollination between the conflicts. So the way that America did, for example, this is uh, sort of separate from that, but the way that America did uh, targeting for kill capture missions changed dramatically in uh, Iraq from 2004, 2006. So early 2004, uh, Joint Special Operations Command is doing about 12 kill capture raids a month. By late 2006, they're doing about 250, right? Now, the reason that that happens is not because, you know, Delta Force and the Navy SEALs went to the gym and, like, you know, got, got buff. better at it. <laughs> um, it had a lot to do with the way the sort of... Um, the system was organized, the way that intelligence was collected, disseminated, turned around, shared amongst agencies, bringing people into the room. Uh, one of the models for how this was done was actually the hunt for Pablo Escobar. Um, but then that sort of system of how we do targeting and the integration of various different types of, of uh, intelligence and so on, uh, that gets applied back to Colombia. So when we think of so when we think of kill capture, we tend to think of you know either special operations or drones. Most people think special operations are kind of cool. Most people think drones are kind of creepy. From the perspective, you know, of from but from another perspective, they're just the Phillips head and flathead screwdriver at the end of a targeting system, right? So that system can be applied to other countries without us actually doing the killing necessarily, right? Uh, that way of doing things can be we can sort of supplement the sort of efforts of other countries and also, as in Colombia, give them smart bombs um, uh, and other kind of help and also help train them on how to develop more sophisticated uh, intelligence systems. So uh, all of which we did, and we helped them kill uh, leaders of, of the FARC and the ELN, which are two uh, communist um, uh, uh, sort of insurgent uh, groups. So. I was interested in that. I was interested in the way that sort of the way that we use special forces changed over uh, the course of, of the past two decades. So the novel starts with a sort of narrator who's a special forces guy. Uh, There's a narrator who is a, she's a journalist. She starts out in Afghanistan. And then the novel moves to Colombia and you have two narrators who are Colombians. And then the novel kind of moves into the third section. Stuff gets weird. Um, but yeah, it, it was kind of, the idea was sort of defined like, a look at the way that America projects power around the world and then to sort of have it, have you seeing it from various different levels, um, whether it's kind of a, you know, a journalist trying to, you know, bridge this world back to the, to America and trying to figure out a way to actually, like, how do you, how do you talk to Americans about these wars and about what America does at this late stage in a way that can kind of break through? Um, uh, the experience of the of American Special Forces guy, his Colombian counterpart in the Colombian military, and then there's like a sort of kid from this sort of little department in um, uh, area in Colombia called Nota de Santander, and you know how he experiences these things, and he's involved with the paramilitaries, and anyway, uh, so that's the idea of it, and then you know you, you start writing it, and then stuff gets weird, so uh, you know. When you're writing fiction, and this is actually what's fun about it, like you, you come up with this idea. I'll give you an example. So the first chapter from a perspective of this Colombian officer, at first was like very policy heavy in terms of them discussing policy. And it was really boring. And so I was like, I need to spice this up. And I gave him a daughter, you know, just like another character to bounce things off of and have fun. And then like that was the most interesting thing about that chapter. So it was like all this stuff's getting cut. 
and now like I'm interested in this, and then you know the story goes in a whole different direction that takes you in places that you know you didn't know, and that force you to think about things from another angle. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm working on, and uh, I've never written a novel before, so hopefully it uh, hopefully it works out. Are there questions from people in the audience? Is there a priest? Is there a Catholic priest? There is a Catholic priest in the novel. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned a few things you're reading just here and there. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, could you tell us? Could you tell us what you're reading, kind of purposely, purposively? Does this make any difference to you today, kind of in this dark season, I, I would call it? Um, is there anything you're reading, writers you're turning to? Um, I mean, I, 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 I read, I try and read pretty widely, and, 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 um, and I try and read, you know, I try and read things that, that are, you know, I'll, I'll read a lot of sort of things that are directly related to what I'm writing about. I'll read a lot of nonfiction. I read a lot of journalism. Um, I read a lot of, you know, government reports or whatever. Um, and then, uh, and then I'll just, you know, but then I'll also make a kind of conscious effort to read things that have nothing to do with any of that. Um, uh, I mentioned I was just reading Mavis Gallant's uh, work. I just read a memoir by uh, Aliyah Malek, who's a, a reporter at the, the New York Times, uh, has a uh, memoir of it, you know, talks about her family's, it comes from this Syrian family, and, and then going back to Syria as, as the country is, is fracturing. It's really interesting. She does a, there's, a, there's a great Jesuit in that book, uh, because there's a Jesuit who's running like psychodrama um, in Syria, which, you know, because everybody's sort of mukbarad, if you criticize the government, people feel like they can't talk, but, you know, the country's falling apart, there's a tremendous lot of violence, and people are, people are terrified, and so he does this, this therapeutic technique called psychodrama, uh, where people can come in, and then they do basically like extemporaneous role-playing as part of a group to, to, to talk about their fears, but it ends up people talking about not just their fear, fears, but their relationship to politics, right? And, and she has this scene where, you know, um, because it's in, in this kind of like, you know, therapeutic space, he kind of gets away with it. The one of the people running it later in the book gets, gets picked up. Um, uh, and they're talking about, you know, well, let's do a panel where we're talking about dreams. And then, you know, one of the people plays the regime and is telling them that they can't dream or that I would like to dream with you, but only if you're not dreaming and you're dreaming my dreams. Um, yeah, it's really, it's, a, it's an interesting book. Um, What's the name of the book and the author again? Um, uh, Aliyah Malik, and it's The Country That Was Our Home, I believe, is the name. Um, I don't know, that's not necessarily an upper in these times, but it's really good. Uh, and, you know, I just read the, the, the Year of Our Lord, 1943. Uh, uh, by Alan Jacobs, which is really good, and it's about C.S. Lewis, um, uh, T.S. Eliot, um, Auden, um, Simone, Simone Weil, um, and I'm forgetting one of the people. Oh, uh, Jacques Martin. And their intellectual and theological responses to World War II and as it related in their work. And it's very interesting. Um, and it ends with um, uh, another Frenchman whose name I'm just going to nail, Jacques Ellou. The there you go. I trust that guy. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, who, it was very interesting. He was, you know, active in, in the resistance. He was, you know, Israel's uh, Yad Vashem labeled, him, you know, listed him as one of the, what's the title? The righteous, yeah, um, but he was also saying, you know, that the duty, the duty of Christians during dark times is to pray, right? Not that, not that you're not also doing practical things, you know. And this is this is a guy who you could not accuse, you know. He wasn't like Sartre, right? Who like after the war was like, well, you know, I such a radical, and then during the war, he's, you know, 
doing absolutely nothing, and then you know after the war, Camus is a coward because uh, I'm not a big Sartre fan. But this is a guy who's you know walked the walk, but he's saying you know there are things that you do in the practical realm, but if you're if you're a Christian, your duty remains to be a Christian, right? And and not to forget that, uh, and 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 not to forget the the space for the spiritual life, for hope and joy and faith and and love, um, while you're also trying to you know push against the, the dark currents that are happening in the world. That was a good book. Chosen. Hi. Thank you both very much. It's been a while since I read Deployment. I think I read it soon after it came out, so it's sort of hazy. But one thing I remember was a lot of shattering of people. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the, like the Humpty Dumpty, you know, can't be put back together again. At least a couple of the soldiers who had been. And I guess, what, how do you integrate that into a Christian? I mean, seriously, you know, in a Christian, I think, of, I'm with the Vietnam generation. Sure. Of people I knew, family. But how do you... Um, deal with that shattering or waste? So, well, there's, the, there's a couple things. Not all, so I wouldn't say every character is shattered, or maybe they are shattered, but in, there are ways to be shattered in a way that's ultimately productive, right? Um, that, um, I was talking to the students earlier, there's a, uh, psychologist uh, Judith Herman, who works with trauma victims, right, who says that you know some trauma, severe trauma, can force everyone to become their own, uh, you know, their own theologian, jurist, and philosopher, right? Because you're sort of these, the sort of assumptions that you had about the world, about faith, about ethics, right, um, get kind of demolished <laughs> in the face of sort of the experience of evil, and then people need to kind of rebuild those sense of all those things, right, to, to, to function in the world. Um, and I think that oftentimes our, our sense of all those things is actually fairly thin, right? And so not, not everybody reconstitutes themselves in a, you know, there's this kind of old trope, there are no atheists in foxholes, it's not true, right? A lot of people, <laughs> the experience of what they've been through in war is the reason that they don't believe in God afterwards, right? I mean, Paul Tillich, uh, in World War I, it's very interesting, you know, the great Protestant theologian, uh, you know, he was, you know, it's like first month, is, you know, he, he goes, he's, he's confident, he shares the faith of a lot of the Germans, that God's like this nice guy who's gonna ensure that things come, turn out well. And, you know, World War I just kind of shatters that idea of, of, of God, but it's not, a, it's not a very good, robust idea of God. He's, you know, he's, he's on the front lines. He's working as a stretcher bearer for you know, his friends. He's a grave digger for his friends and, and, and the soldiers of his unit. He gets fired by a general because um, <laughs> he gets into an argument with his general over whether prayer can, can protect you from enemy bullets. And he's like, no. And the general is like, I can't have a chaplain who has such little faith in the product that he's selling, you know? <laughs> um, and, uh, and then it, you know, uh, and then it just kind of, I mean, Tillich suffered post-traumatic stress. He's you know, said, you know, I was a savage after the war, right? And then he kind of rebuilds this sort of sense of, of uh, the kind of place of God and the spiritual in life. And, um, and so that's one thing. I think one thing that is, also worth thinking about is that there are some people who are, are there are things that just do break people that they don't recover from, um, whether it's in, in war or in life. Um, so it's, it's not always, um, it's not always that, you know, pain leads to, uh, leads to growth, but, you know, for, for some of the characters in the book, like the, the, what they're experiencing is painful, but it's kind of good that they're not good, but it's it, it's important that they go through that experience. It's important that you that you confront the sort of 
inadequacies of whatever kind of idea that you had of the world. Um, and, and then a lot for a lot of the characters in the book, it's fresh. So they're still working through those things, right? You don't see them 10 years later. You don't see, as Carl Marlantis said, the you know, 20-year-old combat veteran at the, you know, at the gas station 40 years later. You see them in the midst of it, right? As they're still grappling with whatever it is that they're grappling with in the various ways. Um, but I don't, you know, I personally don't think it ends poorly for all those, all those characters. No, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it, yes, that is, because I think any kind of intense experience, if you're looking at it honestly, should you know, force this kind of collision of the values that you, 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 you hold and the things that you think about the way that the world should work and the, and the things that you think about how human beings treat each other, right? Um, and then that's a, that's a challenge to you, right, as a human being, whether or not you're thinking about it in a religious context. Do you think that your your experiences are necessary uh, to, for you to write? Like, in other words, um, did you write because of the experiences that you had, or if you if you hadn't had them, would you have been motivated to write? Well, I would I would have wrote. Uh, I mean, and, and so I didn't have, as I said, you know, I didn't do any of the stuff that that's in the book, right? I mean, like, there's some things you pull out of your own life, right? Um, but yeah, I wasn't any of the those narrators. I didn't do any of those jobs. It's funny. Some people like read the book as a memoir. I'm like, it's, <laughs> like, how, like they're different people. Like, I don't know. <sighs> um, but <laughs> so uh, it's not the experiences so much as because I was in Iraq, because I knew, you know, because it really mattered to me, because. I knew people, um, and because when I came back, I had you know friends who were going through things or people who were still going overseas. Um, one of the very strange things about these wars is because they just keep going on. Like you, you leave the core, but you, your friends are still going overseas. In one case, a guy I knew died, and you know another case, you know, gets. Uh, <laughs> Uh, blown up and this is nice, doing great now. Um, uh, I, I, I was in a, like, I was literally in a bar in Brooklyn. I was writing, and it was in Greenpoint. And uh, it's just one of those things where like you're writing, you lose track of time, and then like there's literally like a band setting up with like a ukulele. Uh, you know, it's just like this stereotype of what you would find like a Greenpoint bar. I'm just like, oh no, <laughs> I was having a great time. And then I get a phone call, you know, and a, a you know, Marine that I know is still in, tells me that another guy that we knew uh, got shot in Afghanistan. Uh, he's, you know, doing good now. Uh, but like, that's just psychologically very weird to deal with, right? In front just of a, the ukulele rock band setting up, you yeah. hear about uh, I wouldn't call it a rock wounded. band. Uh, <laughs> 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 it was something. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's just strange and alienating that these two things can coexist and that there's a relationship between what's happening here and what's happening overseas, and I'm in, in the middle of it. And also, you know, there's this kind of, this kind of chip that you have as like a veteran where it's like, you know, we're at war and America's at the mall, you know? But then like you, you get out and the war keeps going on. At a certain point, you need socks or something, so you go to the mall. <laughs> um, and then you're at the mall while your friends are at war. Um, and, <laughs> and that kind of like edge of kind of contempt for civilian life starts to wear off, especially as you realize like civilian life is hard, you know? I, I, know, I know a, guy, a buddy of mine was in a reserve unit who their, their deployment got canceled, and that was like huge leadership challenge, right? Because like there were all these guys who were really looking forward to putting their life on hold, right? Um, like all the problems, you know? Um, like just being a human being, being a father, being a good citizen, right? And, and um, you know, there's a way in which, you know, there's this sort of odd thing where um, like because 
war experiences related to this like questions of life and death, um, it can feel so full of purpose, right? Um, even as the wars kind of feel purposeless, like, because is, are we really actually going to achieve gains? But in the moment, it feels like, you know, like people's lives are at stake here. And then, you know, you come back, and like a lot of veterans respond to that um, you know, scene in the Hurt Locker where like a guy goes into a grocery store and there's just all these, you know, different types of cereal, and it's just like, what the hell is this, <laughs> right? And so there's a way in which sometimes civilian life can seem kind of colorless, right? Though, and meaningless. It's not, right? It's just, it doesn't have that kind of amped up stakes. And I almost feel like it's sort of like, um, you know, like if you oversalt your food, like I could take you to the best restaurant in the world and you'd be like, it needs more salt, right? And so kind of coming back and, and figuring out how to exist in the world is like learning to appreciate the, the real, the serious work of, of being a human being, of being an American citizen, of being a you know, father in my case, of, of, of being a member of a church, of being a member of a community. Um, and so, yeah, I don't even know where I started. Uh, but yeah, all those things were, were factoring into what I was writing about. But it wasn't, it wasn't like there was a one-to-one -one relationship. I was writing it because all those things really mattered to me. You write about whatever matters to you, whatever seems vital to you. Uh, whatever pisses you off, whatever you can't like get your hand on, um, whatever, whatever you can't sort of categorize and file away and not have to deal with anymore. All right, that's what you put into fiction. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, so just building off something you had mentioned was First, you had the conversation with the ch uh, childhood abuse victim. Yeah. And then also you mentioned with the 20 years out veteran and the 40 years out veteran, I think you touched upon the idea of mental health for veterans, both uh, during deployment and after deployment. Um, how would you say uh, it's like the, the, the sort of sig stigmatized understanding of mental health is being confronted by both like the, uh, just like the Marines and like you yourself personally and just like in general, so just like, go. So, um, the, I think, I think we're in a better place now within the military. I think there's a much better understanding of, of mental health as an issue. I think that it's hard, especially because, you know, there's some units in the military where we just kind of, you know, like right now we're overusing our special operations, special forces units, and it's just, uh, creating an unbelievable burden on them and their families. Like I think two years ago, the defense undersecretary of so and so and so and so long title person responsible for special uh, operations community said, in order to keep going, we've had to uh, eat our uh, mortgage our fu future and eat our young. And things haven't gotten better since then. Um, the uh, <laughs> so there is a. So you know we have a much better understanding of of you know what kind of increases risk, especially multiple deployments ongoing for a long time. Um, uh, that we're also sending people out. People do have a somewhat better. I think there's a better culture within the military of people going to ask for help. So that's still a problem. Still something that needs to be confronted. Um, and. Uh, you know, within broader American society, it's interesting because just sort of discussion of of trauma, discussion of PTSD is, is like, it's like a thing, you know? Uh, uh, <laughs> and it's kind of a weird thing because, you know, there's this kind of image of veterans that's either like, it's like super soldier or kind of like damaged victim, <laughs> right? And, and a lot of times people will assume that I have PTSD or tell me I have PTSD and often they don't mean like I have the sort of set of symptoms that are related to a psychological wound, right? The, the, it's just kind of like anything that makes them uncomfortable about the war, right? Like it's just kind of like this kind of thing that you can lay on people, right? It's like, you know, like, are you sad? Are you angry? Uh, <laughs> are you alienated? Like, well, maybe you have PTSD and hope someday there's a pill for that. And it's like, are you an American citizen in an age of perpetual war and you're not sad and you're not angry and you're not alienated? Well, I hope that there's a pill for that because you really should be, right? 
Um, uh, so yeah, it's it's so you know you, you can get weird responses. I after the book actually after the book won the National Book Award, I was walking down the street in Brooklyn, and I saw somebody like on a sidewalk, like a sidewalk cafe, like reading my book. And I was like, awesome, you know. And I came over and I was like, that's my book, you know. <laughs> and so she like looks in the flap, and it's me. I'm not like a crazy person. She, she's like, oh okay. And she looks up at me. She goes. I'm so glad you were able to get a job after the war. <laughs> it's like, thank you. <laughs> so I walked up. Okay, yeah. So, you know, I, mean, I think it, it's it's complicated too because there's this sort of like, and then there's you know, when you have a shooting, for example, like the one that recently happened, people often try and sort of use discussions of trauma to explain the violence, though statistically, veterans with PTSD actually commit less homicides than civilians, so, you know, all of you are more dangerous to me. <laughs> um, uh, so it's, you know, it, 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 there's a lot more understanding of mental health, a lot more understanding of the issues, but though there's also like a sort of whole host of, of kind of weird notions that have kind of attached to it that are sometimes related to things that we'd rather not discuss or, or deal with politically. Another question or two? There's a moment in uh, the life of Anna Akhmatova, a poet from mm -hmm. Russia. So she's standing in line with other wives of, of men who've been in prison for no reason, no one can understand why. And they're all there with their, with their parcels of food hoping that they can give them to their husbands, and they're standing in the desperate cold, and uh, they're all silent. And suddenly she turns, and there's this woman there with, uh, she describes it with purple lips, who says, write this down. I knew this was, I knew, I knew, yeah. <laughs> and and I, I'm wondering, you know, so that urgency, what is it today, what are the urgent things that you feel you need to be writing down right now? Um, so the novel about Columbia is, is one of those, because, um, I think I want to talk about the way that America projects power on the world in a way that people are not familiar with, in a place where it has actually, it just sort of is outside the normal political understandings of what we do, because I feel like with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, people sort of, there are these kind of like ideological lenses that sort of come up. In Colombia, it's like we've been hugely involved with them for a long, long time. People have no idea, except for the show Narcos. Um, and, uh, and so, and yet it's really important and, and, and I think can reveal a lot about not just our relationship with Colombia and, and what we've done there, and, and, but also sort of how we act globally and how that's, uh, uh, and some of the sort of things that, that trouble me or, or I think are worth thinking about. Um, and then uh, nonfiction kind of comes when I just get really annoyed um, with something <laughs> often, uh, or um, when um, uh, somebody asks me if I can talk <laughs> about faith and it terrifies me, so I say yes. Uh, uh, and so that's, I wrote a piece for the American Scholar, but it was originally a speech that I wrote for, for Father Bosco. Um, well, not just for father. I wasn't like I went to his office and <laughs> was for students. He was in the audience too, but he was the one who brought me there. Um, and um, so uh, the next thing that I'm working on nonfiction-wise is about immigration, refugee issues, and national security, and what it means to be an American. I don't know. I'm going to write it and see what it, you know, they kind of change, and, but I'm sort of thinking about sort of people that I know and experiences that I had and, and you know, a couple of different uh, guys who had come to America and went to the Marine Corps, were, were Jeff refugees and went to the Marine Corps, and Woodrow Wilson's speech about immigration during World War I. Like, all the, I'll have these kind of like sort of stories in my head that I sort of feel like, you know, like, all right, this Ali Jassim, who's this, uh, he was an Iraqi interpreter, then went, um, went to, became an American citizen, then went into the army, then went back to Iraq, um, 
Skylands Corporal Atem that I knew was one of the Lost Boys of Sudan. Like just sort of stories about these people that sort of feel like they talk to some of the issues that, that, that matter to me around really what American identity. I think questions of sort of refugee issues and immigration are also questions about really at heart what it means to be an American, which I think is, is something that's really up for debate right now in ways that I find deeply troubling. Uh, and so that's sort of what I'm thinking my way around, uh, trying to anyway. First of all, thanks uh, for your uh, very articulate comments this afternoon. The question I'd like to just to get your perspective on, you've obviously thought deeply about the moral choices that the Marines in your book were making, and whether to shoot people or not, to shoot dogs or not, whether to walk away from somebody's father when they were coming back from a deployment and you knew that his son was dead. Do you think, is there a way that we can prepare people for those kinds of moral choices or is when you think about if you were to go back and do it again with a fresh look uh, is there anything that you can think of that m you might be able to to impart to the Marines or the soldiers that are going to go through that that might m make them better able to cope with some of those moral choices that you know they're going to have to make well that's I mean that's that's the whole reason I write um, that's what literature is for, not to, not to give you a roadmap, because you're never going to get the particular experience, but to get you thinking about the kinds of, the kinds of things, the kinds of, of questions that, 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 whether it's war or just life in general, will throw you away. You know? And I think, um, and also give you that sense that it's, it's, it's not necessarily as isolating as you think it might be. There's a uh, Francois Mauriac, uh, when he won the Nobel Prize in the early 1950s, um, gave a speech where he talked about, you know, when I first started writing about this little corner of provincial France that even the, the, um, uh, and I know I didn't pronounce his name right, um, provincial France that even the French don't know about, you know, I didn't think anybody would care, but, but we forget, we always believe in our own uniqueness and forget that the novels that we loved growing up that, 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 that seemed to describe our, our own lives to us better than we could articulate them themselves, that they came from cultures very different from ours uh, and people very different, yet we loved them because we saw ourselves in them. Um, and so... But, you know, I'll say, I don't... I don't know what uses people are going to make of, 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 of the writing. It's not necessarily up for me to say. Um, I do will say that one of the best compliments that I ever received for the book was a husband and wife came to me. And they told me, she said, he never told me about Iraq. But he read your book. And then what we did was every night he would read a story to her. And then they would talk, not just about the story, but about his experiences. Um, and that's, that's probably the best compliment I've received about the book. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and really pouring it out here, and we could go on, but uh, there, there'll be a chance for further questions just at the back of the room. Thank you. Uh, you have anything else to say, Father Bosco? Yeah, I wanna thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you, uh, Phil. Um, again, uh, really, um, these stories are, I mean, I, I, since, since this is Jesuit Heritage Month, maybe the Jesuit gets the last word. Um, <laughs> but um, but there is a, there's a sense of how you have each character and how you look at suffering, really, as part of the human experience. Um, and the resiliency. I think that's where the hope is in some of your stories. There's a resiliency of the heart that's uh, so beautiful. Um, so Phil uh, Clyde's books are in the back. If you want to have him sign, you can buy one and have him sign one. I, there's a couple things coming up. Uh, and I want to just mention one since we've been t I, we mentioned the word suffering. Um, coming up on next Monday at 5 p.m. in Dahlgren Chapel, is it's called a Liturgy of Music and Prayer for Repentance in a Time of Crisis. And it's a, um, it's a liturgy that's really been kind of sponsored by the students in the different choirs who want to use the Catholic uh, tradition's music, the Kyrie and the Miserere, to sing their way through a kind of penance for what's going on in the church. So I just invite you, there's a, a couple of flyers in the back there. Uh, it's next Monday at from 5. It's really a student-driven um, uh, liturgy. Uh, so if you can come to that, that'd be great. And again, a round of applause again for our... our, our <laughs>